Hello and welcome to Weird Wild World, a weekly series that takes a look at the power of nature. From natural disasters to rare and strange phenomena and everything in between, we will take a look at the wonder and weirdness of our planet. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be taking a look at a triangle more famous than me, the Bermuda Triangle. So what is it and why is it so infamous? Well, let's dive right into these rocky waters and try to find out without disappearing under mysterious circumstances, of course. To start with, let's go over what the Bermuda Triangle actually is. According to Britannica, the Bermuda Triangle is a section of the North Atlantic Ocean off North America in which more than 50 ships and 20 airplanes have vanished. The boundaries aren't universally agreed upon, but it has a vaguely triangular shape with three points being the coast of Florida, the Greater Antilles, and of course, Bermuda itself. The area is an extremely heavily traveled shipping lane. So of course, the more ships that visit there, the more ships may vanish. After all, you're not going to experience a high number of ships and aircrafts vanishing off the coast of Antarctica if so few people pass through there, right? Well, we'll get into some of the theories and explanations behind the disappearances in just a moment though. I don't wanna get too far ahead of myself. But now that we know where the Bermuda Triangle is relatively located, let's get into some of the disappearances and when they began, just to see how long this has been going on. Although the disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle truly began with some consistency in the 1800s, the very first documented case of something strange happening was in 1492, when Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic. This particular instance is what leads many people to believe that something supernatural was and is going on in the Bermuda Triangle. It's said that Christopher Columbus reported that his ship's logbook about a large fire flame falling into the sea, unusual compass readings and strange lights. One source states that Amazon Prime's Inside the Bermuda Triangle revealed how on October 11th, 1492, Christopher Columbus reported seeing a strange light during his first voyage across the Atlantic. Columbus described the light in his log as a small wax candle that rose and lifted up for which a few seconds seemed to be an indication of land. Author Jean Quesar explored the description during the series. He said in 2007, the triangles got a superstition of seafarers and the enigma can be found as far back as Columbus's log. He was the first to sail the area and he noted that on three occasions, the compass pointed in the wrong direction, 11 and a quarter degrees off from the evening reading from the morning reading, which was unexplainable. He also noted that the sea rose without any wind whatsoever, which shocked all of them. And then on the eve of discovering the new world, an unexplained light levitated on the horizon and then rose up. And honestly, if I saw something like that, I would be terrified too. I'd turn that ship around, no thank you, we are not going into gigantic balls of fire. Nowadays though, we know this was most likely a meteor, not a UFO as some have speculated. Another source says, the Canary Islands lie at roughly the 25th parallel and he was familiar with the sky around those islands. Due to this reasoning, it seems likely that the light he saw was not a star or planet. This leaves only a few more possibilities. It could have been a rare phenomenon known as a ball lightning. However, there is no mention of any storms being present on the night in question. Since ball lightning is almost always associated with stormy conditions, we can safely rule this out. Could it have been a meteor? This is also a good possibility. There are a few aspects of this theory that make it plausible. First of all, and most obvious, is the short duration of the light. Columbus only had time to call one witness to his side to confirm the sighting. By the time that Rodrigo Sanchez appeared on the scene, the light was extinguished, or at least no longer visible to the men on the ship. Secondly, the light was described as moving up and down or like a little wax candle. Fireballs are sometimes said to flicker, especially ones with long trains that give off sparks. At first glance, this would seem that the description of a light moving up and down would negate the fireball theory. This would be true if the fireball was witnessed from the land, but we must remember that Columbus was standing on the deck of the ship. This perceived movement can be easily attributed to the ships rolling on the waves, which would naturally change the elevation of an object seen close to horizon. And this wasn't completely uncommon after all. In October, 1492, the Ensisheim meteorite made impact in Germany and was seen as an omen from God. 
It doesn't seem like this would have been the meteor that Columbus saw as it landed a few weeks after Columbus reached the new world. But this is to say that it wouldn't be completely out of left field for a meteorite to have still been there. Still, the fact is that some of the first voyagers in the Bermuda Triangle witnessed such an odd sight definitely lends some credibility. Now let's get to those 19th century ships. What happened to those? From the Patriot to the USS Emprevier to the Mary Celeste, many ships vanished in these dangerous waters. I'm not going to get too deep into each one, but review some of the most notable and see if there's any similarities. Just at a glance, all of them seem to vanish without a trace and with no survivors. Maybe it's the fear of the unknown that so widely contributes to people's superstitions about this place. As one source states, take for example, the case of Theodosia Burr Alston, 29, daughter of former Vice President Aaron Burr and the wife of South Carolina Governor Joseph Alston. She was the passenger on the schooner Patriot, which sailed from Charleston, South Carolina to New York City on December 31st, 1812. After a few days at sea, the Patriot and all those on board were never heard from again. Given that it was sailing from South Carolina to New York, was the Patriot even in the Bermuda Triangle? Close enough, apparently. While at first glance, the cases seem creepy, I've got to say this one doesn't really fit into the curse. Maybe my geography is off, but I'm not sure there's any way you could fault the Bermuda Triangle for this one, unless the ship took a very wrong turn somewhere, you know? Even sources that list it as an incident in the Bermuda Triangle admit that the ship was likely overloaded and that led to the ship sinking. So maybe this ship sinking doesn't explain the Bermuda Triangle, but what about the others? Well, in 1872, the Mary Celeste, also known as a ghost ship or an abandoned ship, became a legend in the Bermuda Triangle. The story of Mary Celeste is an incredibly eerie one. The Smithsonian Magazine published the tale in November, 2007 and wrote the following. The British brig De Gratia was about 400 miles east of the Azores on December 5th, 1872, when crew members spotted a ship adrift in the choppy seas. Captain David Morehouse was taken aback to discover that the unguided vessel was the Mary Celeste, which had left New York City eight days before him and should have already arrived in Genoa, Italy. He changed course to offer help. Morehouse sent a boarding party to the ship. Below decks, the ship's charts had been tossed about and the crewman's belongings were still in their quarters. The ship's only lifeboat was missing and one of its two pumps had been disassembled three and a half feet of water was sloshing in the ship's bottom, though the cargo of 1,701 barrels of industrial alcohol was largely intact. There was a six month supply of food and water, but not a soul to consume it. So that's also a bit terrifying. I think this story alarms me more than the Patriot simply because I can only picture what it would be like to find a completely empty ship, but no survivors. Without any concrete proof, of course, speculation soared. Theories about sea monsters, mutiny, pirates, water spouts, all of these things were thrown around. And Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a short story based on the events of 1884, suggesting a vengeful ex-slave did it. The Smithsonian suggested that the story of Mary Celeste might have drifted into history if not for Conan Doyle's sensationalistic account. So what did happen? Well, authorities at the time weren't entirely convinced of the De Gratia's crew's innocence, yet the ship's condition, intact with full cargo, seemed to rule out robbery or pirates. Documentarian Anne McGregor tried to put this puzzle together, though she had very little pieces to work with. Abandoning a ship in the open sea is the last thing a captain would order and a sailor would do, but is that what Captain Briggs ordered? If so, why? His ship was seaworthy. It wasn't flooded or horribly damaged, says Phil Richardson, a physical oceanographer at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts and an expert in derelict vessels, whom McGregor enlisted in her investigation. The Discovery crew sailed it, so it was in really good shape. The night before the last entry in the ship's log, the Mary Celeste again faced rough seas and winds of more than 35 knots. Still, McGregor reasons, rough seas and a faulty chronometer wouldn't by themselves prompt an experienced captain to abandon ship. Was there something else? McGregor learned that on a previous voyage, the Mary Celeste had carried coal and that the ship had recently been extensively refitted. Coal dust and construction debris could have fouled with the ship's pumps, which would explain the disassembled pump found on the Mary Celeste. With the pump inoperative, Briggs would not have known how much seawater was in his ship's hull, which was too fully packed for him to measure visually. 
At that point, says McGregor, Briggs, having come through some rough weather, having finally and belatedly sighted land and having no way of determining whether his ship would sink, might have issued an order to abandon ship. As anticlimactic as that might be, it seems more likely that this ship was abandoned due to technical difficulties, not a sea monster, not a meteor, and not even pirates. Other ships in that time period may have encountered storms as well, such as the ship called Ellen Austin. So generally speaking, these 19th century ships disappearing in a well-traveled area isn't out of the question. These deaths, though tragic, can be explained. However, it's the 20th century ships vanishing that really began to catch people's attention. Personally, I believe it's due to the fact that there were distress calls and things of that nature, not to mention the idea of massive cargo ships just being swallowed up by the ocean is enough to catch anyone's attention. One source states, reports of unexplained disappearances did not really capture the public's attention until the 20th century. An especially infamous tragedy occurred in March, 1918, when the USS Cyclops, a 542 foot long Navy cargo ship with over 300 men and 10,000 tons of manganese ore on board, sank somewhere between Barbados and the Chesapeake Bay. The Cyclops never sent out an SOS distress call despite being equipped to do so, and an extensive search found no wreckage. Only God and the sea know what happened to the great ship, US President Woodrow Wilson later said. In 1941, two of the Cyclops sister ships similarly vanished without a trace along nearly the same route. As more ships passed through this route, the pattern became undeniable. Only three years after the Cyclops vanished, the Carol A. Deering, a schooner, was found abandoned in the area as well. Then four years after that, in 1925, the SS Cotopaxi sent a distress signal, but was never found. The wreck was found decades later though, in 1985. Since this wreck was actually discovered, I thought it may hold a bit more answers for us. As it turns out, the identification of this shipwreck actually has a part in debunking the Bermuda Triangle itself because the steam powered bulk carrier never made it to its destination in Havana. In fact, the shipwreck wasn't found in the Bermuda Triangle and Michael Barnett, a marine biologist who identified the wreck said the conspiracy of the Bermuda Triangle is total rubbish. The thing about this Bermuda Triangle, he says, if you actually look at it on a map, most of the stories associated with it aren't even in the boundaries. The Cotopaxi is one of these stories. When Barnett moved to Florida from the mid-Atlantic almost 20 years ago, he sought out shipwrecks he could explore while diving. One wreck in particular known to locals as the Bear Wreck and located about 35 nautical miles off the Eastern coast of St. Augustine in North Florida caught his attention. Unlike most shipwrecks in that area, the Bear Wreck was large. Intrigued, Barnett did some research. He took measurements of the shipwreck, looked at historical newspaper articles and insurance records and examined artifacts found on the wreck. His investigation showed that the Cotopaxi was really the only option, Barnett said. It's the one that just kind of screamed out. In 2015, a rumor began circulating that a ghost ship found by the Cuban Coast Guard was actually the SS Cotopaxi. Barnett decided to set the record straight. So he posted a video online saying that the real Cotopaxi was at the bottom of the Atlantic. Soon after he posted that, Science Channel contacted him and the two worked together to make a show about his findings. Perhaps so many people believe that the Cotopaxi mysteriously vanished because of paranormal or curse related activities because it's an easier pill to swallow than storms happen and you can die at every time, even if the ship is powerful, but I'm not sure. But Barnett said that based on testimony at the time, the cargo hold covers were in sad repair. The crew members' families even sued the company that owned the ship and the ship's carpenter testified that the hatch covers meant to cover coal were broken. If water sloshed aboard the ship and ran down into the cargo hold, then the broken covers meant that ship could flood and subsequently sink. I'm not saying that this is 100% without a doubt what happened, but it seems the most likely anyway, and certainly the most fact-based. There's more evidence to prove this flood than any sort of curse of extraterrestrial events though. Now, before we continue on to discuss some of the flight incidents, we're gonna go ahead and take a break to speak about today's sponsor. 
Do you ever wish you could listen to these episodes on the go without leaving your YouTube player open? Well, now you can because all of my episodes are available in podcast form. If you didn't know that, well, now is the time to jump on board because it's free and it's easy. If you wanna start listening to my episodes in podcast form, all you have to do is go to my description box and simply click on my Linktree link and it will pop up a little list of all of my links for other projects, social media, and of course, the links for my podcast. All you do is click on the link that says podcast and it will pull up a landing page to select your favorite place to listen to podcasts and then it will add mine to your list. And if you're a Spotify user, you get a different button because Spotify says so apparently and she wants to be quirky and not like all the other links. But if you wanna listen to my podcast through Spotify, just click the one that says podcast in parentheses Spotify and it'll pull up the exact same thing. We are creeping up on 100 episodes. So make sure you're there. We're trying to upload around the same time as I do the YouTube videos so that you're always up to date on whatever the episode of the day is. So yeah, this is just a little alternative. If you wanted to have these episodes downloaded and in audio form and a little easier to travel or drive in the car when you're commuting or whatever it is that you do. So there you go. Love you guys. Let's go back to the episode. Another incident that's widely referenced is that of flight 19. This one sort of combines the ships and planes element together. See, it started as nothing more than a routine training flight on December 5th, 1945. Five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers took off from a Naval Air Station in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and the planes, known as Flight 19, were scheduled to tackle a three-hour exercise. Their triangular flight pattern called for them to head east from the Florida coast and conduct bombing runs at a place called Hens and Chickens Shoals. They would then turn north and proceed over Grand Bahama Island before changing course a third time and flying southwest back to base. Save for one plane that carried only two men, each of the Avengers was crewed by three Navy men or Marines, most of whom had logged around 300 hours in the air. The flight's leader was Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, an experienced pilot and veteran of several combat missions in World War II's Pacific Theater. At first, Flight 19's hop proceeded just as smoothly as the previous 18 that day. Taylor and his pilots buzzed over hens and chickens shoals around 2.30 p.m. and dropped their practice bombs without incident. But shortly after the patrol turned north for the second lag of its journey, something strange happened. For reasons that are still unclear, Taylor became convinced that his Avengers compass was malfunctioning and that his planes had been flying in the wrong direction. The troubles only mounted after a front blew in and brought rain, gusting winds, and heavy cloud cover. Flight 19 became hopelessly disorientated. We don't know where we are, one of the pilots said over radio. We must have got lost after that last turn. Lieutenant Robert F. Cox, another Navy flight instructor who was flying near the Florida coast, was the first to overhear the patrol's radio communications. He immediately informed the air station of the situation and then contacted the Avengers to ask if they needed assistance. Both my compasses are out and I'm trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Taylor said, his voice sounding anxious. I'm over land, but it's broken. I'm sure I'm in the keys, but I don't know how far down. And this didn't make any sense. How could his plane drift hundreds of miles off course into the Florida Keys? The 27 year old Taylor was new to the area though, and many believe he may have confused some of the islands of the Bahamas for the Keys. Pilots lost in the Atlantic typically point their planes towards the setting and fly west towards the mainland. However, Taylor was convinced he may be over the Gulf of Mexico, so he was heading in the wrong direction. One man even complained over the radio that if they just flew west, they would get home. Taylor's pilots argued against his direction to head east. Some investigators even believe that one of the planes broke off from the group to try and get home, but most of these planes followed their commander's lead. The radio transmissions became faint, fuel ran low, and it's assumed that they crashed into the ocean. Although this was an honest mistake from Taylor, he should have gone west to guide his men home. His disorientation cost him and his men their lives. As before, wild theories flew through the air. An idea that magnetic anomalies, parallel dimensions, and alien abductions played a role in the tragedy became common. In 1977, Close Encounters of the Third Kind famously depicted Flight 19 as having been whisked away by UFOs and deposited in the deserts of Mexico. It's true what Flight 19 is surrounded by oddities and questions. Witnesses claim that Taylor didn't want to fly that day, some speculating that he may have not been fit for duty. Yet none of the Flight 19 members made use of the rescue radio frequency or their planes ZBX receivers, which could have led them towards Navy radio towers. 
In 1991, a group of treasure hunters did find five World War II era Avengers in the area, but their serial numbers didn't match those of Flight 19. The Naval History and Heritage Command explains in further detail how a rescue was attempted within minutes of Flight 19 saying they were lost, but the rescue planes too were lost. So not only were 14 men from Flight 19 lost, but 13 more from the attempted rescue were lost as well, making it a total of 27 men that vanished because of this tragedy. I can't say for sure what happened. Some point to Taylor saying the compasses weren't working properly. Many point to this being Taylor's maiden flight from Fort Lauderdale. Personally, I do think not knowing the area seems like the main cause of Flight 19 being lost here. And as for the PBM Mariner plane that went searching for that one, it was later presumed to have exploded by investigators. Regardless of what you think happened, there are plenty still out there that connect Flight 19 to the Bermuda Triangle and to this only solidifying the legend of the Bermuda Triangle. The Naval Air Station Fort Lauderdale Museum reiterates this and states the following. Several colorful and far out theories surround the plane's disappearance, including one where they were all abducted by extraterrestrials. Another theory asserts they wandered into a strong electromagnetic disturbance that interfered with their compasses. More practically, experts think that Taylor, the squadron leader, simply lost his bearings after his compasses failed. Believing he was over the Florida Keys, Taylor aimed the squadron northeast in hopes that it would lead the single engine bombers back to Fort Lauderdale. Instead, it led the squadron out over the open Atlantic. To compound matters, the planes likely flew into stormy weather. Perhaps he realized his mistake and aimed the planes west towards Florida's coast, but only after it was too late. In 1989, Alec McElhinney and member Frank Hill were brought into the Everglades to investigate a TBM Avenger crash site, which was revealed after a fire. This plane was determined not to be part of Flight 19 because of the Bu No number didn't match. The wreckage parts are on exhibit at our museum. An interesting account was written by Flight 19 expert, John F. Meyer, a former army pilot and aviation historian with his book, Discovery of Flight 19. This book comprises his 30 year search for the lost squadron. Though there's been a lot of debate and rumors circulating around Flight 19, this was a tragic error all the same. And I wish Taylor hadn't been made to fly that day. But Flight 19 isn't the only case of planes vanishing in the Bermuda Triangle either. Though Flight 19 may be one of the most referenced cases in regards to the Bermuda Triangle, there's many others. Flight 441, a massive carrier that belonged to the US Navy, vanished in 1954 with 42 passengers on board. It was only 400 miles from the coast when it disappeared. A three engine Trislander vanished in 2008 and its last known location was about four miles of West Caicos Island. Very recently in early 2021, a 29-foot boat with 20 people aboard vanished as well. According to the Tampa Bay Times, the first sign something was wrong came Tuesday when Bohemian authorities reached out to the US Coast Guard's Southeast Division to alert them that 20 people aboard a blue and white 29-foot Mako Cuddy cabin vessel had gone missing. The passengers were in the off-sited Bermuda Triangle. The group yet to be identified was last known to have left Bimini on Monday en route to Lake Worth, the Coast Guard learned. They should have arrived that day. But something went wrong somewhere in the waters between the Bahamas and South Florida, an area that encompasses the mythical section of the Atlantic off dubbed the Bermuda Triangle or Devil's Triangle. And hearing this, it's understandable why people find the place dangerous and creepy, right? There's rumors that pilots avoid flying over the Bermuda Triangle for this exact reason. One source states, "'Considering the superstition surrounding the Bermuda Triangle, many people assume that airline pilots actively avoid this area of the ocean. Of course, anyone who has flown from Miami to San Juan, Puerto Rico probably knows that's not true. In fact, if it were, pretty much everyone's Caribbean vacation would be ruined. A check on Flight Radar 24 will show that there are many flights that crisscross over the Bermuda Triangle, so it's clear that the area is not actively avoided. In terms of navigation, flights are constantly monitored by air traffic control, so pilots have support if there's a navigation failure. Weather conditions are also closely tracked every time a plane is scheduled to take off. Accidents, of course, still happen, but not any more than in some other parts of the world. Investigating Bermuda Triangle conspiracy theories in general is more of a paranormal pursuit than a scientific one. So if there are any pilots who do avoid the Bermuda Triangle, they are probably just interested in the supernatural or UFOs. 
While entertaining these theories can certainly be fun, you can rest assured that the airline industry definitely doesn't plan its roots around campfire stories. And it's true, though these conspiracies are interesting, they're definitely not proven. A few popular ones are that methane gas on the ocean floor causes ships and planes to fall out of the sky, while others say there's wormholes and water spouts in the Bermuda Triangle. Even stranger still, there's the theories that point to aliens or those that say there's a hole in the Earth's magnetic force that disrupts compasses. Hell, the weirdest one I think I've heard is that some believe there's leftover technology from Atlantis in these waters. But again, as fun as these theories may be to believe in, it's not actually true. They hold no water, you could say. No large releases of gas hydrates or methane hydrates are believed to have occurred in the Bermuda Triangle for the past 15,000 years. Plus, according to the National Ocean Service, environmental considerations could explain many, if not most of the disappearances. The majority of Atlantic tropical storms and hurricanes pass through the Bermuda Triangle, and in the days prior to improved weather forecasting, these dangerous storms claimed many ships. Also, the Gulf Stream can cause rapid, sometimes violent changes in weather. Additionally, the large number of islands in the Caribbean Sea create many areas of shallow water that can be treacherous for ship navigation. And there is some evidence to suggest that the Bermuda Triangle is a place where a magnetic compass sometimes points true north as opposed to magnetic north. The US Navy and US Coast Guard contend that there are no supernatural explanations for disasters at sea. Their experience suggests that the combined forces of nature and human fallibility outdo even the most incredulous science fiction. They add that no official maps exist that delineate the boundaries of the Bermuda Triangle. The US Board of Geographic Names does not recognize the Bermuda Triangle as an official name and does not maintain an official file on the area. The ocean has always been a mysterious place to humans, and when foul weather or poor navigation is involved, it can be a very deadly place. This is true all over the world. There is no evidence that mysterious disappearances occur with any greater frequency in the Bermuda Triangle than at any other large, well-traveled area of the ocean. Plus, even if there really was something strange going on in the Bermuda Triangle and conspiracy theorists wanted to argue it's a cover-up, why would the military and Flight 19 be out there in the first place and losing all their ships? The fact is the Bermuda Triangle is a busy area with bad weather. Considering the amount of ships and planes that pass through there, the percentage that has vanished is somewhat standard. I think framing these tragedies in a conspiratorial light can be damaging at times and start getting into science denial when people talk about wormholes and aliens. The truth is out there. It's just unfortunately rather boring and well, kinda sad. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Weird Wild World. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following and subscribing so that you stay up to date with all the latest episodes as they go live. If you want to connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure you click on my Linktree link in the description box so that you can get a hold of all of my social media and other projects that I'm involved in. Thank you all for making it to another episode of Weird Wild World. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.